think they're already safe. But we're going to have the finest school system anywhere. So I want to thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Betsy, maybe we could start with you. And uh, we'll go over your little section. And then we'll hear from Secretary Azar, Attorney General Sessions, and a couple of others. If you'd like, you could stay. Uh, or if you'd like, you could also leave. <laughs> Don't forget, freedom of the press. Well, thank go you, ahead. Mr. President. Mr. President, after the tragedy in Parkland, Florida, you took swift action. No parent should fear for their child's life when they go to school, and no student, no teacher should ever have to worry about their safety at school. You convened students, families, and educators to have an honest dialogue. You pressed Congress to pass Fix NICs and the Stop School Violence Acts. You called governors, state, and local leaders to action. You asked me to travel to Parkland to visit with students and teachers. And Mr. President, you traveled in Texas, to Texas in May to meet with parents, families, and survivors of the shooting at the Santa Fe High School. We've suffered too many heartbreaking reminders that our nation must come together to under address the underlying issues that foster a culture of violence. And you rightly insisted from day one that we wouldn't keep our children safe by looking only at any one particular piece of this much larger problem. When you asked me to chair the Federal Commission on School Safety, you directed us to explore a range of issues, including mental health treatment, social and emotional learning, the difference that armed school resource officers make on a daily basis, the impact of violent entertainment on the development of young children, the gaps or failures among local officials when they're aware of a troubled minor and fail to act, along with a number of other issues. So we set out to gain input from students, parents, teachers, school safety personnel, administrators, law enforcement officials, state and local leaders, mental health professionals, school counselors, anyone and everyone who's focused on identifying and elevating solutions. I invite my colleagues to look at the slides included in your books, which are a small insight into the Commission's information and gathering process. I've been very pleased to work with my fellow Commission members, Attorney General Sessions, Secretary Azar, and Secretary Nielsen to do exactly that, to learn from those closest to students. Our aim isn't to impose a one-size-fits-all solution for everyone, everywhere. The primary responsibility for the physical security of schools and the safety of their students naturally rests with states and local communities. And it's clear from all of our work thus far that many schools and communities take this responsibility very seriously. Many have employed solutions that uniquely meet their needs and requirements. It's also clear that keeping kids safe at school is not a one-time check-the-box exercise. A safety plan you implement once and call it good. It requires a posture of perpetual preparedness. And what's necessary and right for a school with 50 students in Cheyenne is very different than what's necessary and right for a school in Chicago. Let me briefly tell you about the meetings the Department of Education has specifically led. In May, I met with survivors and family members affected by past shootings, individuals from Columbine, Virginia Tech, Sandy Hook, and also from Parkland. In addition, we heard from authors of the reports written in the aftermath of those shootings. Later in May, we visited Hebron Harmon Elementary School in Maryland. Hebron Harmon's district uses a flexible framework of positive behavior interventions and support modeling one way schools can help create a strong school climate. This approach brings to mind the First Lady's strong leadership on well-being and social-emotional learning through her Be Best initiative. Then here at the White House in June, we met to hear some practical strategies that schools could use to combat negative effects of violent entertainment, media, and cyberbullying. A key takeaway, culture and climate really matter in schools. I was struck and impressed by the obvious passion of Paul Gosman, a superintendent from Iowa. It takes strong leadership to create a positive culture. And that flows from empowered, ed empowered educators who know their students well. Each of my fellow commissioners have led other field and commission meetings during the course of our work. So now I'd like to ask Secretary Azar to talk about the work of HHS in the context of the commission. Thank you, Rich. Well, Mr. President, thank you for the opportunity to be on the School Safety Commission, and I'd like to thank Secretary DeVos for her tremendous and tireless leadership of the Commission and fellow commissioners, the Attorney General and Secretary Nielsen. Uh, we at HHS have focused uh, on the really critical role you pointed out of mental health. Mental health is so central to these issues of school violence and safety. 
Uh, that's, that's, been, that's been our area of focus. I think it's very important to remember, though, that we not stigmatize those with mental illness. Um, the uh, most crimes of violence are not committed by those with serious mental illness. Those with serious mental illness are actually more likely than others to be victims of crimes of violence. And those who are receiving treatment for serious mental illness are no greater threat than any other individual for committing a crime of violence. That's just important that we remember as we talk about these important issues. There are really three key mental health issues that we've identified through our work on the commission. Access, privacy, and civil commitment. Access. Um, how do we expand access to mental health services overall for children and others? Second, how do we integrate that mental health service into our schools, delivering that service where the kids feel most comfortable and where they can get it best and where the stigma can be the least? Uh, how do we uh, look at the appropriate use of different psychotropic medicines, appropriate and inappropriate use, study that carefully? Our privacy rules in the federal government, where do our privacy rules get in the way of kids getting care? Where do they get in the way of teachers and administrators reporting children who need help? Where do they get in the way of family members getting the care that their fa other family members need? And then finally, understanding how civil commitment may help address serious mental illness. We studied these issues in our meetings that we hosted here in Washington, as well as an excellent field visit that we took to a middle school in Wisconsin. On access, we learned how integrating services into schools is ideal. It can really decrease stigma and meet the kids where they are. So we learned that one in five youth suffer from some form of mental disorder, but half of them are not getting treatment for it. We learned that school-based care leads to improved grades, better attendance, health, and mental health care and outcomes. We learned that medications are overutilized and underutilized, depending on the circumstance. And we learned that we need much more research on these medications and their use in a youth population. On privacy, we learned how misunderstood the rules are and how often over-counseled and over-interpreted over those rules are. Uh, we learned ba the barriers to families getting care for their kids and family members, treatment that they need. And we also see how we saw, very importantly, how this issue comes up in the issue of opioids and substance use disorder, how it's preventing family members from getting their other family members' treatment. So we're looking at any needed changes that we can take, and that'll be in the report, better training as well as changes to our rules uh, to help schools, families, and health care providers. We got to see great work in local communities. This school, this middle school we went to in Adams uh, County, in Wisconsin was just tremendous. Integrated mental health services in the schools, they trained their teachers to recognize mental health issues, and they just built a supportive, happy environment that any one of us would be delighted to send our children into, in an area that frankly suffers from tremendous poverty, and yet they still were able to, to deliver that. This was done through funding by HHS, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Agency, in close partnership with the governor in the state of Wisconsin. It shows that it can be done. This can be solved. 75% of serious mental illness starts by the age of 25, so we've got to get these kids in middle school, in senior high, and in college. We look forward to highlighting areas that we can improve our delivery through the work of the commission and our report, and we're just grateful to the president for his leadership to help our children have a safe, healthy, happy school environment. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate it. But I do want you to bring up something that you and I have been working on very hard, and that's prescription drug prices. So as everybody knows, Pfizer last week uh, raised substantially the price of their drugs, and I wasn't happy about it. Novartis also and others. And we made some phone calls, and they brought it back down to what the price was. And I think you're going to see a reduction in drug price. And that's the first time that's ever happened, I believe, ever. Uh, but I was not happy about it, and it wasn't right. And we're working on very much uh, getting rid of the middleman. Uh, could you talk about uh, how we're reducing drug prices and how it's starting to really take effect? And maybe talk about the fact that we appreciate very much what Pfizer and Novartis and the others did. We really do. We really appreciate it. That's correct. Uh, uh, so just for the media and others, I have said that I have never once had a discussion with President Trump where we have not discussed drug pricing and we continue batting a thousand here today. Um, he is adamant about bringing drug prices down and it has come through 
the hundred days of work that we have gone through since the President released his blueprint on reducing drug prices and putting American patients first. Um, as the President said, there have been some really significant moves because the drug companies and others in the system see the writing on the wall. The system is going to change, prices will come down, and they're skating to where the puck is going to be. We've had 15 companies make significant announcements around drug pricing. Pfizer reversed its price increases. Merck announced that it's going to be decreasing prices. We've had several other companies who had told state regulators that they were going to increase prices, and they have now walked back and said they will not follow through on those increases. And we've seen over a dozen companies say that they will have no further price increases for the rest of the year. We'll be coming out with a report on the 100 days progress that we've made so far next week. And then we'll have even more information for you about the historic changes we're already experiencing in the drug pricing market. We've done some transformative things under the president's leadership already. For the first time in history, the president is introducing a regime to import drugs from other developed countries that do not violate intellectual property rights in the United States here. So these are products that are not under patent protection, but where the company, the single company, holds that drug in the U.S. and has increased price. We're going to let competition come in to ensure patient access and competition here in the United States. For the first time in history, the president has done that. In addition, for the first time in history, President Trump is bringing negotiation and discounts to our Medicare Part B drug program. That is the drug program where doctors administer the drugs. For all of its history, we simply pay sticker price for drugs. No discounting, no rebates, no control. For the first time ever, we are unleashing our Medicare Advantage plans to negotiate discounting on $12 billion of drugs. And every penny we save is going to be money that the patients save because we're mandating that over 50% of all savings be passed back to the patient from the work of these insurance companies negotiating against the drug companies. So everybody's seeing the changes coming. We've had historic rates this last month, the highest level of generic drug approval by Commissioner Gottlieb ever in history. We're increasing competition. We're increasing the approval of new branded drugs, bringing new therapies to market. Uh, so it's not going to change overnight. This is a $400 billion segment of the economy. We are not driving for any kind of cheap gimmicks or quick solutions. We're doing things the right way. We are structurally rebuilding this entire segment of the economy to lead to enduring lower prices that are sustainable and support innovation. Thank you very much. And as you know, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is said for many years to have the most powerful lobby. The good news is I don't need their money, so we're doing the right thing. And frankly, I think the drug companies actually, in the long run, I really believe in this secretary, I think they're going to benefit also. But the middleman is not going to be benefiting. Somebody and some very rich people out there that do nothing, make a lot of money, very rich people. Uh, I don't know who they are. I don't want to know who they are. But they don't like me too much right now, I would say. Wouldn't you say? You're so, uh, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you very much. This is, in terms of uh, prescription drugs and drugs, uh, Nothing like this has ever happened before in our country. And I will say that the Democrats heard about it. They're very happy about it, or so they tell me. Uh, I'm sure they won't tell you, but they can't believe what's happening. So, uh, because they want to see that too. They want to see drug prices come down. And uh, nobody's ever seen where they raised the prices 10%, and the following day they announced that they were just kidding. But that's what happened. So uh, thank you very much, Secretary. Fantastic job. You're doing a fantastic job. Jeff? Well, thank you. On drugs, you directed us to reduce opioid by 30 percent. We believe that is achievable. We believe there's at least that much abuse in the opioid prescriptions. And the DEA just announced today reducing the number that's lawfully can be produced. And we've indicted 170 physicians uh, who have uh, been prescribing unlawfully people who are addicted to drugs. Uh, Betsy DeVos has done a great job leading our commission. I've attended five, uh, all five of the meetings. Uh, we've learned a great deal. She is going to lead us to have a report before our deadline uh, in advance of it, and I think it will uh, definitely help make schools safer. I would also say that uh, in addition to those meetings, I met with some 18 law officers, many of whom, some were at uh, Columbine, Aurora, and uh, Parkland, who were there when it happened. 
they believe that we need to do a better job of sharing information to identify the red flags that you mentioned earlier. Uh, the juvenile courts are totally secret. <laughs> Police have secrecy rules. Schools have secrecy rules. Mental health people have secrecy rules. Medical professions have secrecy rules. And we think we can do a better job of identifying our uh, children at risk, children who are suffering, children who may be at risk for suicide, if not violence too, uh, and that create an environment where the teachers and administrators know what's uh, lawful for them to share and not be sued for it. I do think uh, we can make progress in that guard, regard. You also asked us to fix the NICS system. We got legislation you did that, to help that. We are pressing that every day. So more jurisdictions are bringing in, uh, coming into the system and reporting all their convictions. We need to continue to press mental health uh, adjudications and those need to be in the system too to protect people who are mentally unstable from a purchasing gun who have declared um, unfit and uh, we have got two different grant programs 50 million dollars and 25 million dollars that will help hire school resource officers who are trained and also to train teachers uh, professionals administrators to carry guns just in addition attended a school in Arkansas they've been allowing their administrators to have guns for years parents teachers people who had graduated from the school all favored that would not want to change it it's just another example that we don't need to micromanage our schools on how they protect the safety of their children okay thank you very much I'd also like to ask you to bring a major lawsuit against the drug companies on opioids. Some states have done it, but I'd like a lawsuit to be brought against uh, these companies that are uh, really sending opioids at a level that uh, it shouldn't be happening. Uh, so highly addictive. People go into a hospital with a broken arm, they come out there a drug addict. They get the arm fixed, but they're now a drug addict. And I'd like us to look at some of the litigation that's already been started with companies. Uh, rather than just joining them, I'd like to bring a federal lawsuit against those companies. I'd also like to have you take a look at the fentanyl that's coming out of China and Mexico. And whatever you can do from a legal standpoint, whether it's litigation, lawsuits for people and companies. But in China, you have some pretty big companies sending that garbage and killing our people. It's almost a form of warfare. And I'd like to do whatever you can do legally to stop it from China and from Mexico. And uh, if you could look into that, I'd appreciate it. We absolutely will. We're uh, returning indictments now against distributors from China. Uh, we've identified certain companies that are moving drugs from China, fentanyl in particular. Uh, we have confronted China about it. Secretary Pompeo has. You have personally raised it yep, with them, and uh, we've not achieved as much advantage as we would like. Most of it is going to Mexico and then crossing the border unlawfully from Mexico. We're going to work on that. Uh, you've made clear you want us to sue and use legal process against drug companies that are abusing the law for some time now. Uh, we've joined with the states, and we are looking at various different legal avenues to uh, go after abusive companies. Good, good. I'd be very, very firm on that <clears throat> because what's happening with drugs in this country and throughout the world, but in our country, it's a disgrace and we can stop it. We can certainly make a big dent. Thank you very much. We've never seen the deaths that we're seeing today. It's unprecedented in American history. Right. Thank you very much. Secretary Nielsen. Yes, I just wanted to start by, of course, adding my thanks to the other uh, commission members. Uh, we've all been working hard, uh, and we thank you, sir, for your leadership. This is clearly an example where young lives depend on our ability to take bold action. So I'm very confident uh, that report that Secretary DeVos is pulling together will do just that. And so I look forward uh, for us to be able to share that with you. At DHS, uh, most of DHS is involved in this uh, because we do so much on preparedness and working with state and local communities. So we're bringing all of our best practices to bear to really tailor uh, solutions and offer them up through various guidebooks to the communities. As Secretary DeVos said, there is, one, there is not one size fits all. Uh, so we need to work individually with the communities and find what it is that they need. 
Uh, we're looking at training and exercises. Uh, exercises, as we all know, play a very important part of a community's ability to be prepared. Practicing does not make perfect, but it does make automatic. And that muscle memory is the difference between saving a life and waiting to figure out what it is that you should do in the event of a disaster. Uh, today we're going to have another meeting. I'll be joined by my uh, commissioners. We'll look at best practices. We'll look at active shooter. Uh, we're having some uh, practitioners come. We do this always as a school-based approach. Secretary DeVos has a great slide in our book of all the many, many states that we've all interacted with. We're really trying to get that input from across the, uh, across the nation. So thank you for your leadership. I think you'll be very pleased with what we're able to come up with working with our communities. Could you say something that despite the horrible immigration laws that we have to live with, uh, with catch and release and all of the, the horror show, it's a horror show, it's a disgrace, frankly, we'll get it changed. But uh, having a lot of problem with the other party, because they don't want to change for, I guess, political reasons, it can't be common sense. Uh, could you say uh, how we're doing in terms of we're breaking records uh, at the border, law enforcement records? Could you maybe just give a little update on that? Sure, Despite the horrible laws, we're doing very well, please. We, we are uh, in three different ways in conjunction with our partners at the Department of Justice. Uh, continually, the headlines show that we interdict more and more drugs uh, at the border each month, and that is great. So every time we have a new record, a couple weeks later, we surpass it with the amount of drugs we're able to interdict. So we're using a particular type of technology, uh, advanced technology, non-intrusive inspection at the ports of entry. Uh, we also are doing much more on interdicting uh, just border crossers uh, who cross illegally. So you've seen the numbers in July uh, go, down, go down substantially from the, the time before. What's still difficult, though, are the populations that we are not able to prosecute uh, given a variety of current court cases. So we continue to work with Congress. There has to be consequences. Uh, nothing changes. We know this throughout the legal system. I mean, this is true of any part of the world. If there's no consequences for breaking the law, uh, unfortunately, people will continue to do so. So we're working with countries to the south of us to help them understand other options for migration flows to protect their communities at the beginning of that journey so they don't pay smugglers. Uh, there's a whole variety of cabinet members here that are working on the fight against TCOs. Uh, we're having a lot of success against uh, that type of a crime and criminal as well. Uh, so it's good news. We are doing everything we can with an executive power, but we have to get Congress to act. We're setting records at the borders with terrible laws. So if we had the right laws, we could really be doing something special. And there are consequences. When people come up, and I'll say it, when people come up, it's very tough. It's very tough for them. And it's very sad. But we can't handle it. The country can't handle it. You know, we're one country. We cannot handle what's happening. And uh, nobody could. And we don't want to have to be able to handle it, frankly. It's not fair. It's not fair to our taxpayers, to our workers. And uh, so we are very, very tough at the border. We're setting records despite horrible, horrible immigration laws that the Democrats do not want to fix. And I think that's going to hurt them very badly at the polls come November. That's my opinion. So I want to thank you very much. I'd like to uh, ask Mike if you could talk a little bit about North Korea, where we are with North Korea. Yes, sir, Mr. President. Uh, so we're now many months with no additional missile tests, uh, many months with uh, no additional nuclear testing from the North Koreans. We continue to engage in conversation with them about a path forward to a brighter future for the uh, North Koreans. Uh, we have 55 sets of remains that have been returned. The Department of Defense is working on uh, the next uh, uh, work that will hopefully lead to the retain returns of uh, not dozens, but hundreds of the remains of our soldiers that were killed in North Korea. Uh, so continuing to make progress and hoping that we can make a big step here before too long. And the relationship seems very good. I think it's probably hurt a little bit by China because China isn't really happy with what I'm doing on trade, but we have no other choice as a country. And they understand that. So I think we're probably being hurt a little bit with respect to North Korea having to do with China. Uh, but uh, really, we have no choice on that. We had to do something. It was the money that was being drained out of our country and going to China. We rebuilt China. We rebuilt $500 billion a year for years and years and years. And uh, we had to do something about that. They understand that. In fact, I think they're in a state of shock that they've been able to get away with it for so long, so many decades. So we just have to do something, and we did it. Uh, could I ask uh, Secretary Mnuchin, Turkey, uh, they have not proven to be a good friend. They have a great Christian pastor there. 
He's a very innocent man. Uh, I'd like to uh, know, unrelated to the pastor, I just think it's a terrible thing that they're holding him. Uh, we got somebody out for him. He needed help getting somebody out of someplace. They came out. Uh, they want to hold uh, our wonderful pastor. Not fair, not right. But unrelated to that, how are you doing with sanctions on Turkey? And as you know, we doubled up the tariffs on steel and aluminum. Aluminum will happen very shortly. How are you doing with sanctions, please? Sir, we're doing well. As you know, we were very clear with our counterparts there, both Secretary Pompeo and myself, on the release of the pastor. We've put sanctions on several of their cabinet members. Uh, working with you, we have more that we're planning to do if they don't release him quickly. I'd also just comment on the rollout of the Iran nuclear sanctions is going extremely well. We're working closely with Secretary Pompeo. Uh, strongest sanctions in preventing things there. And uh, continue to be very focused on implementing the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, just rolled out the pass-through regs. Lowest rates we'll have for small business and pass-throughs since the 1930s and a big part of uh, what Larry Kudlow talked about in terms of the economic growth. Great. Thank you. Great job. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary Wilkie, so we got choice pass for our vets, so our vets don't have to wait in line for six weeks and end up with a simple condition that's terminal because they can't get to a doctor. Uh, I'm very proud of choice, and we're proud of a lot of the things we've done for the vets. But could you give us a little uh, how are you doing with Choice? You've had it now for a couple of months. How is that moving along? So it's moving along well, but I would um, start with something else. We are experiencing, with the economic boom, lowering rates of vets on employment. Uh, probably the best trends that we've seen in many, many years. Of vets unemployed, that's right. That's right. And uh, that, is, that is a boon for uh, our warriors across the country. In terms of the Mission Act, um, Director and I, Director Mulvaney and I will be talking about it tomorrow. We have the opportunity to do what has not been done in many years, and that is widen the aperture when it comes to the health choices available to veterans uh, across the country. Uh, no longer in states like Montana, where Secretary Zinke's from, uh, where they have to travel four or five hundred miles round trip. They can, they can do this at home. Uh, we're making advances with mission in the area of telehealth, which is a, a way to uh, impact the mental health issues that many of our veterans face. So for the first time, we have a comprehensive and strategic way forward in making a lot the lives of our veterans better, and uh, it is, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're doing great. And congratulations. Thanks. We got through. just got passed. So congratulations. You're going to be there for a long time, and you're going to do a fantastic job. It's the first time uh, a secretary has really had a chance to do a fantastic job, because without choice, I think it would have been impossible. So we have choice now, and our vets are taken care of, and just make sure they go see the right doctor, right? When they need it. Sometimes they won't need it, because you have plenty of great doctors at the VA. Uh, if I could ask Secretary Acosta a little bit about your association health care plan, which has been now uh, completed. It's in service. Uh, how are you doing with it? That's correct, Mr. President. Um, just in the past week, uh, there were newspaper articles. A number of chambers of commerce around the country have reported that they've uh, started these plans. They're uh, in the process of offering it to their small businesses. Uh, you're seeing chambers in Nevada, in Texas. Uh, we're talking to some in Iowa, uh, up in the Minnesota area as well. Uh, associations uh, here in Washington that represent businesses across the country are, are looking at them. Uh, just today at, at the department is an association representing members of the gig economy that are uh, looking to, to start these up. And, uh, and so for a, a rule that is uh, just weeks old, we're already seeing implementation and we're seeing quite a bit of excitement. The U.S. Chamber had a call with the member chambers of commerce. Um, and initially they weren't going to do the call because it's August and things are very quiet, but they decided to do the call anyhow. And they had a near record number of local chambers call in onto the call to learn how they can go about doing this. So there is uh, quite a bit of energy and excitement. That's fantastic. I appreciate that. And also, Secretary Costa, you're moving very nicely on your health care plans, too. 
And one of the big things is the individual mandate is gone. We got rid of that. That was from Obamacare. That was by far the most unpopular thing in Obamacare. Uh, we actually got rid of Obamacare except for one vote, but we essentially have — so we're doing it piecemeal, and it's going to be gone pretty soon. So uh, fantastic job. I heard great things about the health care plan. And a lot of people are signing up. A lot of associations are signing up. That's right. Uh, far ahead of what we even projected. That's so correct. That's yes. And maybe I could just, I'll finish off with Secretary Perdue, uh, the farmers. We love the farmers. And you know, our farmers are brave and they're great patriots. And as you know, uh, China uh, sort of attacked our farmers by trying not to buy from our farmers. They know the farmers like Trump and I like them. I love them. And uh, they are, I hear, despite everything, they're starting to really do well. They got out there like they are. They're incredible patriots, but they're incredible entrepreneurs. And they're selling the coin and the, the, the corn, and they're selling the soybean, and they're selling everything at levels that are soon going to be pretty good levels. And, you know, our farmers have been hurt for 15 and 20 years. They've been — a lot of bad things were happening. And I talk about soybeans, where prior to my election, if you go five years back, uh, soybean prices were cut by 50 percent. So uh, this was happening long before us. And markets are closed. Canada charges us for dairy products uh, 275 percent, uh, tariffs of 275 percent, which makes it ridiculous and impossible. But we're taking care of that situation pretty easily. But I'd like to just ask, how are the farmers doing? I, I'm hearing it's starting to really pick up. The farmers are resilient, Mr. President. They are, uh, embody the American values and spirit of entrepreneurship, risk-taking, hard work, and uh, those American values. And we've talked about before, you call them patriots, and they are. Uh, obviously, there are some price uh, 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 constraints right now, but they believe what you're doing in China, as you've tried to indicate to them, will lead to a better and brighter future uh, when we get these trade uh, relationships reestablished, and uh, we believe that'll be soon. I applaud what Ambassador Lighthouse is doing, the conversations that we're having on various fronts, and we think uh, you've got the attention and the leverage of the international community regarding the abuse that American farmers have taken in many places, both tariffs and non-tariff measures, in the EU and in China and many other places, and uh, we think these will be rectified very soon. Well, the word abuse is a good word because this country was abused by other countries, both friend and foe. You know, our allies, frankly, did better than many of our enemies when it came to trade. It was a terrible thing happened for many years, and uh, we're changing that around. In fact, what I will do is I will speak to one more because I'd like to have Bob Lighthouse just give us a little update quickly on uh, where we are with NAFTA and the various trade deals. I, I can say this, we're doing very well. Uh, I'm in no rush. We want to make the right deal. NAFTA has been a disaster for our country. Mexico and Canada uh, were, if you think about making or if you think about deficits, we had a deficit of $135 billion a year on NAFTA. You look at New England, you look at different places where factories are still empty. They still haven't recovered. But now companies are moving back. So we're either going to do a good NAFTA, a fair NAFTA for us, or we're not doing NAFTA at all. Where are we, Bob? Well, I would say, first of all, Mr. President, <clears throat> I would just underline what you say in that, is that we have an $800 billion trade debt and something that's not sustainable over a long period of time. And I appreciate the opportunity to go out and, and, and negotiate these deals one at a time. In terms of NAFTA, right now we're meeting with the Mexicans literally as we, as we sit here. Uh, and I'm hopeful that in the next several days we'll, we'll have a breakthrough. There are still some difficult issues to work on, as there always are at the end. Uh, I know you. And by the way, Bob, if we don't, that's okay. That's, if you don't have a breakthrough, as you call it, don't do the deal. Because it's a, a lousy situation for the United States. We have much better alternatives than that. You understand? Yes. Sir. So if you can't make the right deal, don't make it. All right? Yes, you know. Sir. I only tell them that every day. It is, uh, yes, sir. I, I'll, I'll, attest, I'll attest to the fact that he tells me that. Yeah, like the he also tells me what the alternatives are. That's true. So, um, but I think in this particular case, the best alternative may be to get a good agreement. Okay. And I think there's a possibility of that. Uh, I'm hopeful with Mexico, and then I'm hopeful once we get one with Mexico, that Canada will come along. So, I feel reasonably good about that. But as you say, there are still some things that have to go through. 
We have made headway on a number of other areas. We've had, as I've told you, some 15 or 20 other smallish agreements that have been helpful for agriculture in other areas. I call them hitting singles. Every, every, every time Red Bat is not on run, we're hitting single after single, and literally every, every few weeks we have one, and there are several, I won't go through now, but there are several that are in play that will make a real difference to specific people and, and, uh, and sectors in agriculture, but in other areas. Uh, Korea, as you know, that, that agreement is finished, and I think it's a step in the right direction. Uh, and then we have Europe, where you started a, 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 an initiative that, that Larry Kudlow and I are working on, and that is we're, yeah, I mean, that's a major initiative, and it's something that we're in the process of putting together the, the kind of team we need to, to negotiate on tariffs, but on barriers, and, and hopefully open up a lot of new opportunities for, for American products to be sold in Europe. And I think I can say that we're talking to China. They very much want to talk. Uh, they uh, are just not able to give us a deal that's acceptable. So we're not going to do any deal until we get one that's fair to our country. Uh, EU, we're doing very well. Uh, they didn't want us to put tariffs on their cars, and uh, they therefore decided that uh, they were extremely happy with the deal they had. In fact, they told me, oh, we'd rather not negotiate. We're very, very happy with the deal we have. Well. They made $151 billion last year. They should be happy. But I said, but I'm not happy. And so we, uh, we were ready to do tariffs on their cars. But they came. They saw us a week ago, as you know. Most of you were here. And I think we're doing well, Bob, with respect to the EU. We're negotiating something that hopefully will be fair to them and to us and to everybody. A big difference from what it is now. Right now, it's impossible. Uh, they have barriers where we can't get anything through. As far as Mexico and Canada, Mexico, Bob, told you about, we're not negotiating with Canada right now. Their tariffs are too high, their barriers are too strong, so we're not even talking to them right now. But we'll see how that works out. It'll only work out to our favor. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely.